What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. Quick programming note, we're back to the fortnightly schedule for Swift News, as some have been calling it. What that means is every two weeks. Uh, during WWDC, I was doing it weekly, just because, duh. Uh, but we are back to the every two weeks, just so you know what to expect. Um, all right, let's throw up the rundown so you know what you're getting into, and uh, we'll do the damn thing. First up, we have something I meant to share last week, and that is the talk show from WWDC. John Gruber has Craig Federici, Greg Joswiak on. Uh, you know, they do this show every year. It's great. It's usually at the end of WWDC, kind of wrapping everything up, but you get a lot of extra insights, and I highly recommend checking it out. It is pretty long. I'll pull up the YouTube timeline here. It's an hour and 35 minutes. However, a nice new feature from YouTube, which you may not have noticed. I do it on Swift News. You can timestamp it, and John has done that, so you can get the topics, whatever you want. You can kind of hover over the timeline, to see what they're talking about. Um, I enjoyed the whole thing though. Definitely check it out. You'll get a lot of extra insights. On to the Swift UI portion of the show. We have one of my favorite features of, of Swift UI and iOS 14, uh, you know, besides grids, of course, but uh, we have the match geometry effect. And I've seen a lot of people playing with this on Twitter, doing some really cool things. And, you know, to really sum it up, keep it simple, it allows for some pretty cool transitions from view to view, as you'll see here in some of the videos, right? So if you have this like menu of views, that view can pop out. And you've probably seen this in apps, like a lot of apps are doing this currently in UI kit. However, Swift UI makes it a lot simpler to pull that off. So you can see great transitions here. And of course, Swift UI Labs walks you through the whole thing in code. It's pretty long, I'm not gonna go through that, but I do wanna to go to the bottom because we got a slow motion video uh, of these effects to really like drive the point home here. Um, so yeah, you can see the dessert, how that view just kind of, it's a great transition into the next view and back into the, the grid menu. So um, that's kind of a basic example of what match geometry effect can do. Uh, a lot of cool stuff is being done with this, but uh, I, I think this is probably gonna be used very, very heavily in a lot of apps just because of the pretty sweet transitions uh, it can allow. Now let's move on to one of the trickier parts of Swift UI when you're, when you're just learning, right? Once you get it figured out, you're good. I'm not there yet. I'm still learning it myself. But uh, a lot of discussion on Twitter about, you know, when to use state object, when to use observed object, just the whole data flow in Swift UI uh, is, is tripping a lot of people up. And that's because it's a whole new way of doing things for us. You know, we're used to the imperative way. Um, but here's a quick reference built by Chris Eidoff. By the way, this site, Swift UI Property Wrappers, new project from Donnie Walls, probably recognize that name. Um, but he is referencing something made by Chris Eidoff, uh, this nice little decision tree on like when to use what. But Basically, the next three articles are, are a lot of the same things, just explaining state, binding, you know, observed object, state object, uh, all that stuff. So we have Donnie Wall's Swift UI property wrappers. Uh, we have Majid's here, the difference between state object, environment object, very similar topics, but I'm doing this for a reason. And then here we have John Sandell's A Guide to Swift UI State Management System, essentially talking about the same thing. Why I want to feature all these and show this all to you is because if you're just learning Swift UI, 100% this is going to trip you up a little bit. You're going to, it's going to take you a little bit to figure it out. So I recommend reading all three of these articles uh, and others as well, because yes, a lot of it will be repetitive, but I do believe repetition is the key when you're learning something. Plus you'll hear it taught from a couple different perspectives. Uh, and then you probably won't fully get it until you actually start using it in, you know, real projects and getting your hands dirty with it, if you will. So, um, like I said, I just, I know this is tripping me up at the moment. So I wanted to feature all this state management stuff uh, to recommend like, hey, if you haven't learned Swift UI yet, make sure you will allot some proper time because this is a big part of it. Now onto something I hadn't thought of yet with Swift UI uh, here by Saroon here, custom navigation bar title view in Swift UI. Now, ever since the iOS 11 transition to large navigation titles and they introduced the notch, I've been real sketchy on like customizing the nav bar. For those of you that may not have been around during that iOS 11 transition, uh, a lot of apps custom nav bars got really messed up when Apple decided to change their default nav bar and add the notch. So again, that's giving me pause. But the way this is explained with Swift UI, I'm not so leery about doing that. So just like everything in Swift UI, the, the nav title is another view uh, that you can put in a V stack, right? You can do title, subtitle, uh, and you can do things like, I, this is probably my favorite. This is probably what I'll adopt most in my apps is uh, SF symbol and then title, just to dress it up a little bit, especially once you get those colored SF symbols in there. Um, and then yeah, you can do uh, title, subtitle with the button. But a, a quick article by Saroon uh, showing how you can customize the nav bar. And like I said, I, I don't feel as you know, scared about customizing it like this. So I'm definitely probably going to uh, adopt this by adding views into that uh, Swift UI nav bar. 
And speaking of Swift UI views, gotta thank today's sponsor, and that is fellow YouTuber, fellow community member, Mark Moykins and his Swift UI views mastery book. Now I enjoyed Mark's book because as you can see on the screen, it is highly visual. You got the code on the right and then what the code does on the left, oftentimes animated as well. I love that. And Mark has spent the past couple weeks updating the book fully for all the new stuff in Swift UI that was just announced with iOS 14 and it's clearly marked in the book what's the new stuff versus what's the old stuff. And this book is currently on sale for 40% off, but only until July 28th. So if you're watching this after then, eh, sorry, but you can still check it out. Link will be in the description. And after you've checked out the free trial, if you like what you see, check out this giant bundle Mark has with, you know, it's got the book, the full Xcode projects, flashcards, everything you need to know to learn about Swift UI views. All right, back to the show. Next up, we have the design portion of the show, and Apple has updated their official design resources uh, for iOS 14. Now, these are things like sketch files, uh, Photoshop, as you can see here, those are what's available for iOS 14. But if this is your first time seeing these design resources, you can get Adobe XD also for the iOS 13. Um, but yeah, if you are designing or prototyping your app and you want this kind of native stuff, you can just pull it right out from these free design resources. Next up, we have the 2020 Apple Design Award winners. I definitely scroll through this article, hear a little bit about the apps. You can see screenshots of them, uh, you know, what made them win the Apple Design Awards. But what I really enjoyed that they did this year, because normally this is like a show at WWDC, they come on stage, they get their awards. Uh, you couldn't do that this year. But what they did was they had this video here, and I'll, I'll full screen it, there'll be no audio. But they, uh, you know, they videotaped themselves calling the Apple Design Award winners to like let them know they had won. And like some of the, re it was just, you know, you'll get a little choked up, uh, I bet. So this is a really cool video they put together, uh, you know, talking to the developers and, and like I said, breaking the news that they had won and they talk about their app. So definitely check out this video. It's not super long. It's only like two minutes or so. Uh, but I thought that was really, really good. Next up, I wanted to share this tweet thread just to, you know, convey this idea. And it starts off with Shahab's tweet down here. It says, I think a lot of developers chase the idea of a perfectly written and organized artistic code base at the expense of just making something cool and fun for the end user. I'm going to tackle both sides of this, so stick with me here. And then, of course, Guy Rambo chimes in, says, uh, there are lots of apps out there sitting in developers' computers because they think the code isn't good enough. So I always recommend people focus on user experience and actually shipping stuff. As long as your code isn't a huge spaghetti mess, you'll be fine. Uh, and let me pause here. We're going to talk about something else in a second. But I wanted to share this because I know a lot of people that, that watch my stuff are either just learning or maybe earlier in their career. And I get questions about this kind of stuff all the time from people learning. You know, they're, they're so concerned with architecture. They're so concerned with 100% test coverage. They're, they're so concerned with all this stuff, which... I kind of get, right? Like you you think that's what it means to be like a great coder. But as we're saying here, this comes oftentimes at the expense of not just shipping a good product. You know, you're, you're kind of focused on, on the wrong things almost. Now, uh, let me go back to here as we shift into the other side of this, right? So John Maddox says, you'd be shocked at how non-perfect the code is and what you think are the best apps out there. Programming this hard and full of edge cases, this is great. All code starts with wonderful patterns and devolves into a mess because the world isn't perfect and edge cases are real. So, you know, there, there's multiple sides to this, right? If you're an indie developer or at a small startup, yes, you should absolutely focus on, you know, pushing out great products, iterating, right? Because you're, you're at the beginning of your your product. Well, you know, that's a little different when you're at Google, Apple, Facebook, and you have this giant code base. That's where architecture, clean code, because, you know, hundreds of developers are working on this. And if it's a shit show, like it's impossible to work on. So, cause a lot of the responses to this tweet were like, oh, that's great if you're an indie dev, but you know, when you work at a huge company, you can't do that. And it's like, of course, you know, different, you know, phases of the development require different skill sets and practices. But the main reason I wanted to share this was because I know a lot of beginners out there are insanely focused on having perfect architecture, all this perfect code, perfectly refactored. And at the end of the day, we're, we're shipping products to customers. Um, so maybe I'm not saying don't worry about your code quality. I'm not saying that at all, but you know, maybe, maybe shift your focus a little bit. Next, let's move on to one of Swift's core topics, and that is type inference. Uh, if you're not familiar with what type inference is, this is, again, super basic, very core to what Swift is. It's basically you don't have to determine the type. Here, as John points out here, you don't have to say, hey, 
42 is an int. Like Swift can just see 42 and it will infer that's an int. It can just see hello world and it'll infer that's a string. So if you wanna get a refresher on these basics, definitely check out John's article. But I wanted to use this as an intro to what I really wanted to share. And that was an awesome talk at WWDC here, I'll make this bigger, by Holly Borla, uh, embracing Swift type inference. And she works on the compiler team at Apple. And it was just a really great talk. It's not long, it's only like 20 minutes, I believe, yeah. Um, but it really breaks down how Swift in the compiler actually infers what type it is. And I'll go to, and, and she compares it to like putting a uh, piece of the puzzle together. And I believe at like 811, yeah. So it talks about how you have all these like, uh, you know, generics and, and types. And it talks about how Swift can basically, again, put this puzzle together is exactly how she describes it to, uh, you know, infer all the types. And it's all animated. It's very, very well presented. So uh, I highly recommend checking out John's uh uh, article on type inference to kind of get that refresher, get that base, because, uh, you know, this this talk is a little more advanced because it gets into like compiler stuff. Uh, but I think that's a good primer to check this out. And I think both of those combined are, are a great way to learn or at the very least a refresher for you. Guess what? The Facebook SDK messed up again, crashing all kinds of apps. Uh, and I wanted to share this tweet because yeah, I kind of got a little bit of a laugh out of it. And, and the point of me sharing this isn't to bash the Facebook SDK might be might deserve it but i'm that's not what i'm here for um but the tweet says uh feeling pretty good about refusing to put the facebook sdk in drafts uh despite you know repeated requests for the features that were enable i have zero trust that that bloat bag of code is only doing what is asked of when embedded in an app that's from march of 2018 and then he tweets out greg here possibly my most evergreen content right and he's, i think he's retweeted this a couple times every time like facebook messes up so again i'm not here to bash facebook the point i wanted to share this and talk about the whole facebook sdk fiasco how it's crashed like some of the biggest apps in the world on launch uh, is just you need to really, really be careful about what SDKs and, and third party libraries you're you're bringing into your app. Like I'm sure for some apps, there's absolute business reasons why you want to include the Facebook SDK and you almost have to. Right. So I'm not here to say never do it. I'm just here to say is just don't just throw in SDKs and third party libraries all willy nilly because once they're they're part of your project, once you bring them in and that's somebody else's code. You don't know what they did. You don't know what it's doing. Uh, I mean, you can look into it, of course. But anyway, that, that's why I wanted to share this. Just be careful uh, about what you bring into your code base. Next, I wanted to share a tool built by Curtis Herbert. Uh, he, he also developed Slope. Uh, it's called Sim Genie. And really, I really like the, I'm going to go down to it real quick. I just want to talk about it right now. Uh, love the old Game Genie reference. For those that are old enough to remember like Nintendo, uh, the Game Genie, love the reference there. But essentially what this is, uh, is he, well, he says it right here. It's basically um, surfacing a lot of the cool stuff you can do in Apple Simulator, you know, kind of in a, in a UI. Uh, it says it here, basically. Apple has been adding a lot of hidden capabilities to the Xcode Simulator, but they haven't been making those capabilities, you know, particularly easy to use or discoverable. So basically you have to do a bunch of command line stuff to get cool stuff on the, uh, on the simulator. And actually they just did a, uh, a talk at, about this at WWDC 2020, which I'm using as the basis for a video that's coming out soon, uh, talking about those cool stuff you could do on the simulator. So all that stuff that I was watching that you could do, uh, Curtis here basically took all that and put a nice UI around it. Um, so it's not so hard to use. You're not typing these weird command line commands, right? Um, it's all nice wrapped in a UI. Uh, so he talks about the product. <laughs> he made me, made me laugh here because right, he's, he knows what's going on. He's been an indie developer for a long time. I highly recommend reading the whole thing. Um, but, you know, let, let's talk shop here. But uh, <laughs> this made me laugh. It's a developer tool, which means it's targeting a niche which historically has a strong inverse relationship between their vocal demand of features and their willingness to spend money. Calling you out calling you out. Um, I don't have much to say about this, except I'm an idiot. You know, it's software prime for Sherlocking. Like you said, Apple can easily just wrap a UI around all those command lines and have this product relatively easily, right? And he says he'd be okay with that. Um, but anyway, more more interesting stuff about the whole indie dev world and how you choose like which products to build. So I appreciate Curtis uh, putting this out there and sharing his thoughts about why he built this and kind of his monetary or, you know, his uh, you know, business plan for, you know, how to make money because it's a one-time purchase, not subscriptions, it goes into all that. So definitely check that out. And hey, this is not sponsored or anything like that. If you do want to check out Sim Genie uh, to get all that cool stuff wrapped in a nice UI, uh, link will be in the description. Not sponsored. Moving on to AR Corner here, we have Jordan Singer. First of all, I love his uh, URL. I build my ideas. 
also calling out a lot of developers. A lot of developers have ideas. How many actually build them? We're all guilty of it. Anyway, um, the uh, the Glass OS. So it's what the whole kind of gist of this article is, again, recommend go check it out, is a lot of the stuff in iOS 14 that was announced was all about compact UI and like the widgets and all that stuff. And you can kind of start to see the writing on the wall about, you know, it's no secret Apple's developing AR headset, right? That's been, you know, <laughs> the worst kept secret in the world. What Jordan does here is kind of takes all this new, new iOS 14 UI and puts it on what could potentially be a glass UI, right? So if you have glasses, there's little messages in the upper right hand corner. I'm just going to scroll down to show the pictures real quick. You can obviously read the article. Um, you know, the, the new compact call. Uh, here's what that could look like, you know, in, in your glasses, just in the upper right. Uh, you know, turn by turn navigation. So I, I just thought this was a pretty cool, right? You can see see the widgets. Just a, a little sneak preview of what Glass OS or whatever they call it, like, could be. Of course, we don't know exactly what it'll be, but you can see how all this compact stuff, right? The picture in picture, it's very conducive to this glass OS is app clips. By the way, app clips, I think are 100% an AR feature, right? You just look at a QR code and you get to use a quick little piece of the app and you're done. Um, yeah, like we can talk about app clips on your phone. Cool. I think it's 1000% an AR kit feature, uh, I'm sorry, Apple Glass feature. Um, that's when I think it'll really kick off. You know, Siri's new compact design, right? You can see that just in the corner of your glass because it's, uh, it's also clear that it's going to be Apple glasses and AirPods combo is what's going to be like the thing. Um, anyway, I thought this was a cool thing to share for the AR. You can kind of see what a UI could potentially look like, especially now that we've seen iOS 14 stuff and uh, how that could fit into a, a glass OS. Um, so a good, good uh, little preview from Jordan there. Sticking with AR here, we have a chessboard with the new gesture, you know, recognition stuff. You could actually play chess, right? Your hand picks up the chess pieces. You can kind of tell like it's not there's some occlusion there, right? It's not perfect. It's a little rough around the edges, but you know, this is just a prototype. It's the beginning. You could see how, you know, if this gets refined, uh, how cool it could be. I can be interacting with the AR uh, objects. And then kind of a AR LOL combo here, because this made me laugh. Said so one of the more popular apps in 2023 for Apple AR glasses will be an app called Smile, right? From Brian here. Basically it just, it puts <laughs> stupid smiles on people's faces. <laughs> I don't know. It's so creepy. It made me laugh, right? They're not actually smiling. It just puts a smile on the faces. Uh, that made me laugh. And then finally, the LOL of the week here, programming in a nutshell from Martin. Uh, let's implement this big feature. Done in an hour. No problem. Uh, let's just fix this tiny bug. A week-long trek into the jungle that is your code base, discovering several new species of bugs along the way, and ultimately questioning your life choices. And, uh, so true. Hit the nail on the head with that one. So that wraps up this episode of Swift News. I uh, hope to see you in the next one.